Once upon a time. In a land far away. I'm Katrina. And I'm Jeff. And welcome to the Fairy Tellers Podcast. Myth, legend, folklore, fable. We explore what they say about cultures then and now. Grab a hot cup of cocoa and a comfy seat. While we retell you a thing. So, for our first episode of the Fairy Tellers podcast, we wanted to kind of explain who we are and why we're doing this project, and also go over some quick definitions of what fairy tales are, what fables are, what myths, legends, folk tales. That way, every time we kind of use those words, everyone will know what what I mean, what my definitions are. Yeah, it'll be good for me, too, just because, as people will learn in a second, I'm not anywhere near an expert in fairy tales or anything, any of these things. So it's like, you know, I'm going to be learning probably just as much as anyone listening to this as you kind of go through and explain what the the actual definitions and things, uh, the differences between the different types of, you know, tales and folk tales and whatnot. Yeah, it's interesting because I recently, like, saw somebody's job description listed as a folklorist. And they're like, oh, I'm a person that studies, like, folklore. I'm like, oh, me too. That's awesome. Except that, you know, they, like, got a degree in it. They're not like me who's just like, I'm going to, like, read every book that anybody ever has written on it and then just sit alone with my knowledge. Anyway, that's a creepy way of describing why I'm into fairy tales. Let me tell a less creepy reason. (laughs) So anyway, I've always been really interested in superstitions, cryptozoology, and just different legends and like ghost stories and stuff. Ever since I like was in elementary school watching like unsolved mysteries with my parents, I just thought it was very fascinating. But it wasn't until I was actually studying early childhood development in college and was coming across different curriculums for early childhood that included fairy tales. And I kind of wanted, I was like, what is the point of teaching kids these like really old, like outdated stories? And so I actually was wanting to read them. My sister was going through a divorce at the time. And so she was living with me, and what we would do is we would read Grimm's fairy tales at night and then laugh a lot. (laughs) Like, (laughs) you wouldn't have thought that so much dark murder would be so hilarious. But it is. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Anyway, we would sit up at night, and we would be telling these, like, stories to ourselves, like the bird the mouse and the sausage which is such a weird anthropomorphic sausage story (laughs) long before sausage party was ever (laughs) yes uh but yeah so we were like just up at night like goofing on these stories and then my husband would come in the room and be like what's so funny and then i'd quickly like retell him the story and he was like what is this garbage (laughs) (laughs) and i you know i need to learn more i need to know more about this my my sister ended up moving to a different state and settling out um on the other side of the country but i still wanted to make her laugh and so i started writing up retellings of the fairy tales and then she was like other people need to see these and so then i made a blog and then I started researching more about fairy tales and the history of them and what's behind them. And then I started forming opinions and, (laughs) and I wanted to tell people about it. So it was funny because a couple months ago, a friend of mine was like, with all this controversy happening with the little mermaid, I want to hear the original story, Katrina, but I don't want to just read it. I want you to tell me the original story because it's so much funnier. And I realized while I was writing that up on my blog, and people can head over to the Fairy Tellers WordPress blog if they want to read that story. 
Um, but as I was writing it, I realized that I had a bunch of opinions <laughs> that really did not fit on the blog. Um, cause the blog isn't for me to be like, actually in the history of the story. And so I started joking around that I wanted to do a podcast and then here we are. <laughs> yeah. I think it's really cool too. Like I've been following the blogs and stuff for for a long time and yeah like, like four years it's really cool that as i've learned more you know just from talking to you which has been one of the things is like yeah i'll do a podcast because i loved hearing you explaining different things about what you've been learning you know i don't want to go through and sit down with like these musty old textbooks on fairy tales and folklore and stuff like that but i will be happy to have it filtered through you just like i'm happy to have all these folk tales filtered through you but i was just thinking about how like what you said is by retelling these stories in your own way, like using gifts and making jokes and stuff like that, you're kind of like participating in the tradition of folk of of these fairy tales and folk tales in the sense that like people would tell their own versions and tailor them to their audience. And you're speaking in a way that speaks to a modern day audience by using memes and things like that. And it's like not only is it just funny entertainment to like hear these old stories retold in a new and interesting, funny entertaining way but it's also like keeping that tradition alive which is something that i think is really really cool and you know one half of the reason why i'm really excited about this podcast yeah and with the podcast because i had people even back the like four years ago they were saying this should be a podcast uh and one of the reasons why a podcast is such a good format for this is because People back in the day used to sit around telling each other these stories while they were like finishing up any kind of sit down work that they needed to do. And it was normally like women who were trying to finish up laundry or sewing or whatever. And so they'd just be telling each other these stories and cackling. And so I hope that while we're doing this podcast that, you know, at least some of our audience is half listening, half folding their laundry. <laughs> yeah, no, that's so true. Like, in you know, so much of what folk tales and fairy tales used to be has been replaced by, you know, more what we would consider like traditional media, like TV and movies and stuff like that, where it requires kind of more total concentration. You have to like watch it and listen and pay attention. And um, I think it's just been really recently with podcasts that it's been coming back. Like even radio kind of had fallen fallen away a little bit but you know people really are like i know for myself when i listen to podcasts is like when i'm driving to and from work like i can't be watching videos or netflix shows while i'm driving or like i'm at the gym which is you know rarer than it used to be but you know like <laughs> you know while i'm otherwise engaged doing stuff and again like you said too it's like when i'm cleaning if I, especially if i'm by myself like i just flip on a podcast so i can listen to something while i'm doing all these other menial chores so it's like like you said it's the perfect format a way to continue this oral tradition you know using technology to we reach a, a broader audience but it's still like very much kind of getting to the heart of what folk tales and fairy tales were supposed to be and how they were supposed to be told yeah because the thing that makes a fairy tale a thing that makes like a folk tale is the oral tradition of it the actual speaking it out loud not the person typing it up and then the other person reading it you know at a different location it it was it was an, a performative art and a podcast I feel like gets it a little bit closer to that I mean you do have the thing of you know I'm not separated through time and space exactly yeah the difference between like theater versus watching something on TV so there's a little bit of a difference in the performance like of it but it still is that like my words are flying into your ears <laughs> On the wings of birds, my <laughs> words are attacking your ears. <laughs> so before we go much further and I keep butchering and mixing up the differences between fairy tales, folk tales, all that stuff, maybe we should, you know, enlighten me as to what the differences are. Because, you know, that's something that I don't really understand. Like what what makes a fairy tale? What makes a folk tale? Absolutely. I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> Because I would love to enlighten you. What I live for is somebody just like coming up to me like on the bus and being like, can you tell me the difference between like a fairy tale and a folk tale? I'm like, yes, thank you. I will have this conversation with you. As I've been studying fairy tales, 
uh, one thing I was finding interesting was that the more that I looked into it, the more tangled the word fairy tale gets because there are lots of different people who have like different perceptions of it. And I actually recently got this book that's called Fairy Tales, A Very Short Introduction. And it's by Marina Warner, uh, who actually wrote this other book that I had gotten into years ago. Uh, but this is like a brief outline. It's funny because one of, in the very first chapter, there's this <laughs> like heading that's like the thorny hedge questions of definition because it really is even among experts people who study this the definition for fairy tales it is controversial which i'm sure when people decided to listen they weren't like oh can't wait to get into the controversy of fairy tales (laughs) that juicy juicy controversy (laughs) uh and It's interesting, I don't know how many people would know this, but the title to Animal Farm used to be by George Orwell. I know people are going to be like, did I hear that right? Is she talking about Animal Farm, like from English lit? Yes, I am. (laughs) But it was called Animal Farm, a fairy story. Because the definition for a fairy tale used to be a lot looser. Where it basically was like, any time a story involved any kind of like magic or transformations, talking animals, anything like that, they were like, oh, this is a fairy tale. So there are a lot of books that used to be considered fairy tales um, and that some people actually do still consider fairy tales. Hans Christian Andersen, I'm sure people have heard of him. Um of the little mermaid fame (laughs) (laughs) um people have even said uh lewis carroll's uh alice in wonderland is a fairy tale that used to be considered a fairy tale same as pl traverse's uh mary poppins so lots of stories that included fairy tale elements people were like oh that is a fairy tale or they'll be like, oh, a fairy tale for our time. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 I'm going to fight you. Yeah, so what what's different? What makes them not those things not fairy tales? So the definition that I am working with for fairy tales are uh, stories that have uh, magic, transformations, uh, talking animals. But those stories have to come through an oral tradition which means they have to have been passed down generationally through time. So they have to have, like, come from somewhere. And a definition that does a better job of kind of encompassing that, or a word that does a better job of strict gatekeeping on that is folk tales. Okay. When, when you say folk tale, that absolutely has to come from the, the Volk the people like it has to have been passed down through long traditions. So fairy tales are folk tales, but then not all fairy tales neatly fit into folk tale. This is the old, you know, square rectangle, rectangle square thing all over again. Yeah. It's like, it's very murky water. Um, But for me, I'm kind of a person that I, (laughs) if I say folk tale, I mean a fairy tale. If a fairy tale is not a folk tale, then I don't think it's a fairy tale. Gotcha. But not all storytellers do. So, for instance, Hans Christian Andersen, The Little Mermaid. I don't consider that a fairy tale because even though it includes fairy tale elements, it has one author, the person who originally wrote it. And what's interesting is a lot of his stories were based off of folk tales and so Agnet and the Merman, which is a story that he based his The Little Mermaid off of, mm-hmm. that is a folk tale. That is a fairy tale to me. Gotcha. So it's basically one of the big distinctions being like, you know, the single author thing. Like like you said, it's a folk tale it comes from the people. It's something that's just there's no one person that's credited with having created it. It's just this common story that's told through everyone. So yeah, that makes sense. And I actually never knew that Hans Christian Andersen was writing these stories like just out of his own imagination. I thought it was kind of like a, a Brothers Grimm 
situation there where like they did take stories that were around and they were just collecting the stories and recording them. Yes. But they didn't they didn't actually write them. They may have like again had to make some choices on what they included and what they didn't based on the all the different versions that they heard. But I always thought that Hans Christian Andersen was the same thing where he was taking, you know, the folk tales of his area and writing them down. I didn't realize that he was actually just being inspired by his own folk tales and then writing his own thing. Kind of like um, you know, J.R.L. Tolkien, where he was inspired heavily by you know, English mythology, especially like Norse and Scandinavian mythology and and taking those elements, making them very much his own and making, you know, what he considered to be kind of like a, a, a mythology. Yeah. Not really mythology, but mythology for, you know, England that was like truly just English in his mind. Yeah. And what really, what helped him along creating the world of like Lord of the Rings, like creating Middle Earth, what helped him along was the collective understanding of fairy tale elements. Because if you start talking about dwarves, people immediately are like, oh, I know what those are. Or I I have some idea of what he must be talking about because there's a shared element, there's this shared language. When he talks about elves, people understand what he means, but then he also had the freedom to make them his own. Yeah. And to also add new creatures and it's because he had a solid foundation of past characters to draw from to create what he was making. Yeah. And it is interesting, too, that, I mean, even going a step further, although it's, we're getting a little off topic here, but, you know, yeah. now people now people take his work and use that, like, because people are familiar with the the things that he's created, like, they can easily shortcut elves and orcs and all halflings and hobbits and whatever yeah and people get an understanding an image of what that is so it's yeah. kind of cool how it just like they f- it all feeds into each other yes that like these creations can create more creations and there's a shared understanding which is awesome another thing that happens when i'm telling a, f- a fairy tale or a folk tale is sometimes you know i'll get to the end of the story and somebody will ask me what was the point of that what was the moral and I'm like, oh, I think what you were expecting was a fable because, and again, fables also have this interesting, loose definition that moves around. But fables to me, when I say fables, I'm talking about talking animals, stories about talking animals with a clear moral at the end, or sometimes they write them at the beginning. But people usually are thinking of Aesop's fables. Yeah, I was going to say, that's the only thing that I really yeah. think of. There's also, um, chess so stories would fall under fables for me. And what chess so stories are, are how the rhino got its wrinkly skin. Because oh. usually in those stories, some of some stories that are chess so stories, we have to be careful because some of those have been written by just one author. Right. Um, I think Kipling was one of them. I'd have to double check that. But... Other people, it's it. They're actually part of kind of like a mythology that then exits out of mythology and goes into folk tale, right? Because since it's not religiously attached, see all of these terms they run into they're, each other, which yeah. is why we're defining them exactly. But well, yeah, the thing that and because in Chesso stories, there's usually a very clear moral, like rhino was grumpy and greedy and he got what was coming to him and so like you shouldn't be grumpy and greedy or you'll get what's coming to you well the thing that i am surprised by is like so you're saying they have to be talking animals yes because i kind of always thought that the definition was more leaning to the side of having a you know like a clearly stated moral like when like arrested development i always think about the dad like using the guy whose arm falls off to teach his kids a lesson. He's like, and that's why you always leave a note or whatever. I was like, that's a clear class, a clear yeah, you know, example of a modern fable. Yeah. You're like, it's a modern fable. And you know what? If I was like retelling that story and I turned that man into just a lizard that could quickly detach its tail. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Maybe it would. It yeah. Would I'd be like, and that's why you always leave a note. Uh, and I also didn't re. I didn't um, think about the fact like so fables kind of being a subcategory of folk tales like fairy tales are like it's that oral tradition no definitive author because like with Aesop's fables he didn't write those he just collected them 
or or not. So are we- so yes, Jeff. Aesop's fables are actually a collection of fables that got uh, credited to Aesop. Um, he was a storyteller in ancient Greece, but he was again a collector. But since you know, we're talking about when when I say ancient Greece, I mean like six twenty BCE. Oh wow! So. Like predating the Bible is what I'm talking about. Like I'm talking yeah. Old Testament is when they were recorded. Yeah. And so it is hard to tell, like, do we credit, like, did he come up with them by himself? Because he said that he collected them. But we'll also find as we discuss more, like in the episodes to come in the podcast, that that is a technique that some authors have used to trick people into thinking that they're reading something that a story that's older than it really is. Right. And again, going back to Tolkien, that's, uh, that's something that he, like he kind of used that technique again, not in complete seriousness, but his whole thing was like, he found Bilbo's written story and he was just, you know, passing it on to us. Yes. To, to lend this like air of mystery. And so when we're looking at Aesop's fables and we're like, oh, I thought Aesop wrote them. And it's like, well, maybe he says he collected them and maybe we should believe him. Uh, but who knows? <laughs> but yeah, like, Fair enough. it's very hard to tell when you're looking back nearly 3,000 years. Um, it's hard to tell if somebody is telling the truth or not. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's so separate through time. It's like, how else would we, how, how would we confirm it or not? Yeah. You know? It's tough. So when it comes to fables and I say, oh, they have to have animals and you're looking at like arrested development and like, oh, that was teaching like a moral. I thought it was a modern day fable. That would be considered a morality tale because it doesn't include animals, but it does teach a lesson of what's right versus like what's wrong. It It's teaching a lesson. And I, I feel like it's a lot narrower of a lesson than like a true morality tale that usually includes like broader understandings of good versus evil. Right. As opposed to like, always leave a note. Like, <laughs> this is a morality tale. about. <laughs> it's like, it's not going to save your soul to have left a note. Or will it? Who knows? Who don't know? Are you getting your kicks on Route 66? If you're passing by the Petrified Forest, make sure to stop in Joseph City on Thursday, Friday, or Saturday for Mr. G's Pizza. Ask for Andy, and if he's there, let him know that he can run from the law, but he can't run from the eyes of Zeus. Grab a slice or a whole pie to go, or enjoy Mr. G's Pizza in the back room, which features theater seats and movies perfect for the whole family. Mr. G's Pizza, the only restaurant in town worth going to. So... As like I think it's getting pretty clear that like all of these definitions they do they twist on each other, they climb onto each other, they lead to each other. And uh mythology is another thing that we're going to be covering like in this podcast because it's very hard to separate mythological elements from fairy tale elements. So mythologies are basically stories from a lot earlier on that are to teach like how the earth was made how the seasons changed they were stories that were created by people to make sense of the human condition and like explain unexplainable things around them yes like what happens when we die questions that now we kind of think of as more either <laughs> they're like split between scientific questions and religious, and religious questions. questions. <laughs> now they're in mythology, they're intertwined, the two things, because they didn't have the science that they do to explain seasons. And they also hadn't created religions yet to explain life's mysteries. Like, where does the soul come from? Where does it go? Like, after it dies, what makes a person a person? What is the value of a human life? They. Yeah, hadn't come up with any clear answers, and they used mythologies to 
uh, answer those questions and to bind them as a community. And you talk about too, like when you say mythology, I think a lot about, you know, like every, whenever you're learning about history, when they go all the way back, you know, it's like you learn about the creation myth of each culture and it's different. You know, I remember learning about like the creation myth of like Japan and, and like there are all these like native American creation myths and it's just really interesting how, every culture when you take it all the way back to the beginning they're coming up with these stories that like you're like you said explain things that they don't understand it's like where where the earth must have come from somewhere so what what was that and it's really interesting to see you know how how their cultures that you can still see traces of you know now the cultures that they've become i don't know like how different values that these cultures have have worked their way into the myth or because of the myths have been something that's gotten passed down to their current you know states yeah uh, cause the one, the creation myth that I'm probably the most familiar with and probably any Western listener is the most familiar with is Adam and Eve. Right. Just because that, that one is in the Bible and then the Bible spread and, you know, got disseminated and the Bible stories are in a lot of Western literature. Yeah. So, like, mythologies are really interesting to study. And they're alluded to all the time, like you said. I mm-hmm. mean, talk about Greek mythology. Like, you know, you've got your Achilles, Achilles tendon. Yes. You, know, you talk about, like, something being, like, a Sisyphean task or... A Herculean task. Or a Herculean task. I mean, like, like, and that's everywhere. Especially if you go into, like, literature like Shakespeare or whatever. It's like they're constantly talking about... They are. Cupid and Psyche is one that, um, the love story between Cupid and Psyche, that's one that comes up a lot. And also that love story between Cupid and Psyche, it comes up in a lot of fairy tales. So where, where the connection is between mythologies and fairy tales is mythologies were created and then religions were created alongside of that because religions were are formed so that people can um, have tasks that they can complete or rituals that they can complete that give them a sense of control over their lives or gaining favor with the gods. And so after you've created this mythology that, you know, Thor is going to come with his hammer and he's going to defeat the the frost giants, so that you can start planting your harvest and he's going to beat the frost giants back so you have enough time to gather those in again. After you have created that mythology, you are going to want to try to appeal to those gods to, or to either thank them for defeating those frost giants or to ask them to defeat those frost giants. But once somebody has created a religion around like a mythology those characters then take on an aspect of holiness where you're not allowed to use them. A culture is not allowed to use them for basic storytelling because it's blasphemous. It's right, it kind of becomes like canonized. You have to follow what the rules are. Yeah. Yeah. And you, so you can't just create a story around like Thor doing something that might be out of character or might, paint him in a bad light and so one thing how one thing that helped create fairy tales and lead them away from mythology is they had to create kind of characters that they were allowed to play around with that they're allowed to um blaspheme with (laughs) 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 almost every now and then you'll encounter a kind of where fairy tales or mythologies bump up against a local religion. And those are going to be fun to examine because there are tales of, um, from Irish mythology where priests will come into it, where Christian priests have come into the area and have tried to overpower these kind of pagan characters and the more Christian that a area got or any religion, if if it started taking over an area, you'll see it start to overtake some of the the local mythologies or the local fairy tales and defeat the local characters. So when you say that, do you mean basically like the stories that they were telling go away or basically the 
like re- like the religious characters kind of take places of different characters in their stories and kind of like embody them? I mean, or does it v- vary? I mean, it definitely varies. But what I was talking about specifically was that you'll start seeing people telling stories about priests being able to like overpower. So for instance, there's this one tale in Ireland where there's this very powerful crone or hag, um, which is actually, those words are considered negative connotations now, but they, that it used to mean just a very old, powerful witch, somebody who Mm -hmm. just had a lot of powers. Um, And there's the fact that they're like negative words now is very indicative of the way that Exactly. These things got taken over. Exactly. Because a priest came in and he had more power than the hag. And yes, so the a religious Catholic figures. priest. Yeah, a Catholic priest in a story um, came in and was able to subdue her and freeze her into rock. And, or he was able to like pa- call down the power of God to like freeze this hag inside of stone. Um. And so those start to be the stories that that are told by the people in the local area because they're coming up with stories of people, of their religious figures being able to defeat other cultures' mythological or religious figures. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. It's fascinating. And we'll also see tales where, where the Grimm's brothers, they'll tell stories that start to include Christianity weaved into it. But it's interesting because they always make sure that, you know, the the character that they like is able to trick the devil. He's able to defeat the devil. There's a story, The Child of Mary, where the Virgin Mary adopts this little girl and who's like homeless and takes her up into heaven, but then she breaks the rules of heaven and is kicked out of heaven. And so you'll see a little bit of religious crossover into fairy tales, but normally fairy tales are trying to operate outside of religions so that they're characters right. that, that kind of exist in their own time and space. They're not to explain like where the sun is coming from, but they take place in unknown kingdoms in with like kings of unknown origins. Right. It's like the king. It doesn't say like the king of France or whatever. Exactly. It's like the king of the land. Yeah, because these are supposed to yeah be operating outside of time and also outside of any like religious experience. Interesting. It is, right? Yeah. <laughs> we should do a podcast about it. <laughs> <laughs> so the last term that I kind of want to look at are legends. So legendary figures are fascinating because they usually spring from a real person or persons or from a real event that happened. And slowly they'll kind of blow them out of proportion. The, they start doing tasks that, you know, they'll start to kill a bar when he was only three and like, wear a coonskin cap because that's what he did. Or I'm making allusions to Davy Crockett in case people don't know my references. It's interesting. It's one of those terms where it's like I knew the definition, but I never actually knew the definition. Like, and people use it kind of correctly, you know, and talk about, oh, that guy's a legend or whatever. Yes. Like modern legends, like um chuck norris you know like chuck norris exactly chuck norris is a great example because he's a real person he actually does have arguably some skill with like martial arts but he's become this character that's like you know he can i can't think of any chuck norris jokes right now but you know he can do all these (laughs) just ridiculously overpowered things yeah that's great but you know again you think about you know i think about legends you go back to like the founding fathers you hear all this stuff like benjamin franklin sailing his kite, flying his kite to get struck by lightning. And, um, you know, George Washington who chopped down the cherry tree. And it's like, did that ever really happen? Probably not people think, but (laughs) yeah, there's, there's no kind of discernible evidence. And what's interesting is legends begin to form, uh, to bind communities together because like what right now we're talking about a lot of like American legends and those are obviously fairly like 
not modern, but you know when I'm talking about Aesop's fables that happen 600 right, years BC, years. yeah. Uh, They're when much I, more recent. Yeah, when I look back to just, you know, when America was founded and we, we create these uh, legendary figures that exemplify the qualities that we really want for America. Yeah, so the legends then embody the our values like our national values something that we can kind of rally behind yes and like it, honesty you know you've got yeah. the two ones that are honest you know george washington chopping down the cherry tree honest abe well and then you know what's a little bit ironic and silly about those is we're like i would never tell a lie and we're like is that story true and they're like mm, i don't know <laughs> <laughs> we value honesty but also <laughs> just kidding uh just because like th- that is the nature of storytelling that is like the nature of legends is that people become bigger than they actually were yeah things get simplified you know what i mean like you it's it's really hard to tell a good story with all the nuance like you everyone's been involved in someone telling a story and they go into every little detail and it's like you know what it doesn't matter if it's 100 percent accurate for the sake of the story and the impact that you're trying to give it so again the more time that goes on the more things get simplified and exaggerated and you know, try to kind of boil down to the essence, which comes around, like you said, the value that we're wanting to instill through telling that story. Which is what I think is so fun about Chuck Norris jokes is that the tellers, like Chuck Norris is still alive. Everybody can quickly fact check to see if like, (laughs) like, can he kill a gorilla? Like, you know, (laughs) yeah. I don't think Chuck Norris would ever want to kill a gorilla, like, just to be clear. I was just trying to think of something big and strong. But anyway, what's what's funny is, like, they're they're so tongue-in-cheek. Like, everybody act, everybody knows that, you know, Chuck Norris isn't really going to do the things that they joke about him doing or that he's strong enough to do the things that, like, he's doing. And so it's a little bit tongue-in-cheek that we're like, oh, we're making him into a legend, but also... We're aware of what we're doing. Right. It's very meta. And I I love it. As opposed to, you know, I don't know, maybe 50 years from now when people are like, you know, Americans used to be strong warriors. And, you know, think about Chuck Norris, the legendary figure Chuck Norris, who is so strong and we'll have Disney musicals about him. And it- <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. I hope to live to see those days. <laughs> and it'd be it'd be funny like if we do, but um and what's interesting in the day that we're living also when you look back at these legends is we're a lot more aware of things that are true versus exaggerated for the sake of national pride. Just because, you know, we're very much like, well, let's look and see if that's actually a true story. Oh, it's not a true story. And then we question, okay, does it have a value? What is, what is its value? And right now our society, what they're valuing is being able to notice that people are both good and bad. That, oh, yeah. That they're, that they're capable of very, very good things, but also very terrible things at the same time. And so I feel like since those values are becoming more important than you know creating a national story of like how great we all are how great our founding fathers are as we start valuing looking at humans as capable of complex yeah yeah, as being complex and like nuanced yeah this those stories the legends that we tell are i think going to become less and less um important to, mm-hmm. in in a context of storytelling to create that national story. Right. I think they'll still be told or they'll still be remembered as like, oh, so America used to do this interesting thing, just like a lot of other countries, but it's easier to look at this new country's way of handling legends. So, yeah, I, I'm fascinated by legends, how legends can then turn into more fairy tales Robin Hood is a good example of that, of how a legendary figure can then start entering into fairy tale stories. And I think I I would have to double check on myself, but also I think Santa Claus falls under a legendary figure that then starts getting into fairy tale 
territory. Are you talking about like you know, you know, Saint Nicholas, Saint Nicholas being a real person, but then that person's legendary status getting blown up so much that now we think of him with riding on a sleigh, driven by flying reindeer and I having was, elves. I was actually thinking more about the real Krampus that existed and and <laughs> would, Krampus, Krampus, who would truly. <laughs> In real life, go around and just beat naughty children. One one. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. It's like Saint Nicholas or Father Frost, or you know, it's it's interesting how a legendary figure, like a person who probably did really exist, then starts turning into folklore and fairy tales like of their own. Now I'm going to write a whole series of American fairy tales and it's going to be all about like the mythical adventures of like Johnny Appleseed and George <laughs> Washington and their encounters with fairies. That'll be awesome. I look forward to <laughs> My new book series out next fall. <laughs> so I think that the study of all of these things, fairy tales, folk tales, fables, legends, myths, I think all of it is very important to understanding both how human beings have enjoyed storytelling to bring people together and how that has changed over time and how it's served multiple purposes. And also a super important thing to me is that when you study different mythologies, folk tales, you start to be able to understand the new stories that are being created the contemporary stories that are being created out of an area. And something that I hope turns into some kind of a lifelong passion for me is amplifying fairy tales from places that are not Europe. I feel like, you know, currently we have people who are kind of being forced to learn about the Bible and european mythologies so that they can understand western literature and western literature is important i think all those important to listen to but also we have so many rich stories from other parts of the world that influence their art and there's no way that we're going to be able to understand like japanese literature or the story of anime if me as a western person if i don't understand the stories that they've told in the past. Yeah, for sure. And like, it's one of those things that I think is really interesting about it is just being able to understand different cultures, like even our, even our own in the sense that when you're looking at fairy tales or whatever from different cultures and you start to see what types of things they value, what types of things are important to them based on the types of stories they tell, based on what happens in them. And you start thinking more about you know, our own stories in that same kind of way. And you can find like similarities, differences, whatever. Um, But like the more, you know, like the same thing, like the more I understand Greek mythology, the better I'm going to understand a lot of, you know, Shakespeare, the same thing, like you said, you know, you can understand more anime by understanding Japanese culture. Cause there's so many things that make their way in there that are, are from, you know, these common stories that like make no sense to us because we we don't have the same kind of like context surrounding them. Yep. And it's the same, just understanding like South American art, understanding African art. There's no way of fully being able to understand that. I don't think unless you understand the stories that are being told with with the art because people pass on a visual language. It's funny. I was recently telling my sister, it's funny that I make memes about fairy tales because fairy tales were memes. They are culture that is being passed down through visible symbols and that culture through those visible symbols, you know, if you think of an apple, you thinking of either yeah, there's so much Adam and Eve, that. a poison apple, like there's all this like back history that's just connected to that one thing. And it was, it went throughout culture and now it means more than just an apple. I hope everybody enjoys listening along as we travel around the world and through time looking at all of these myths and legends. Jeff and I are both going to try to be looking at uh, just a wide array of 
stories to tell you and drawing from stories that we have today. Now, that's one thing I'm looking forward to is being able to hear stories that I haven't heard before. Same thing with like on the blog where the, I love reading stories. It was like even, a, you know, grim stories that just I haven't heard. But it'll be really interesting to get into stuff that is covering different cultures just because of all the opportunities to learn that we'll have about, um, you know, different cultures and different periods in time. And I think it'll be a really cool, you know, it's it's a podcast about fairy tales, but we're going to learn about so much more than just fairy tales. We'll learn about science. We'll learn about religion. We'll learn about history and culture and different places all over the world. And I think that's a really exciting journey to go on. And I'm happy that hopefully some people are going to be, you know, joining with us and being able to point us in towards interesting, um, you know, fairy tales or whatever from from cultures that they are familiar with. Yeah. I mean, I feel like my biggest dream for this podcast is that some folklorists who have like doctorates, they want to like email me and be like, you're wrong. And I get to be like, please tell me more. <laughs> I'm so excited. <laughs> like, and you'll have their emailers that you can just pepper them with questions. Yeah. And- <laughs> Because this is, I'm excited to to delve into stories and to learn more and then to tell people, you know, what I'm finding because it's all been really fascinating stuff that I've been looking at so far. You've been listening to the Fairy Tellers Podcast. If you enjoyed what you listened to, please leave us a review or share us with your friends. For more fairy tale content, head over to thefairytellers.wordpress.com for lighthearted retellings, Or follow us on Instagram for daily fairy tale memes at the fairy underscore tellers. Special thanks go to Andrew Forey for our music and Clarice Inch for our artwork. This episode contains additional music from Kevin McLeod at Incompetech Music. Check him out at incompetech.com. Farewell, and may the blessings of elves and men and all free folk go with you. May the stars shine upon your faces. J.R.R. Tolkien